Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We have been sharing with you in the past several messages on the fact that God is not in control of all things, as people have taught erroneously. Instead, He's in control of the results of the choices and the activities that you and I have made. We are the ones who have a free will and can either choose to walk in his ways or not. Well, because of that fact that you and I are responsible, then we must learn to deal with all circumstances that would come our way. And we're going to talk about ruling over all circumstances. We see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice what it says here about Jesus, what he did. He was upholding all things by the word of his power. He controlled everything that was going on by the word of God. When it speaks of the word here, this is not the word logos, this is the word rhema. If you hear for the first time, we point information out that's important. Rhema means that which is spoken, the spoken word. And so it's talking about how he was upholding all things by the spoken word of his power because the spoken word releases the power of God that's resident in the word of God. And when it says he was upholding, not only is this upholding things, but it's also the way he brought things into being because this is a word which is translated bring, or bringing forth in the scriptures, and it really refers to bringing things forth by the spoken word of his power. That's how he controlled everything. That's how you are going to be able to control every situation. God's the one who brings the results, but you're the one who puts them in operation through what you do with the word of God. Now, regarding the tax of the enemy, you can overcome in every situation. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, for he was, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And remember, sin has no dominion over us because we're dead to sin. We're alive unto God. And now we can walk free from sin as we walk in line with the Word. Just as he conquered all temptations without, yet without sin, you and I can conquer all temptations in our life as we get the Word in us and we walk in line with the Word of God. You and I are to walk uprightly before Him with a perfect heart, and we will see God accomplish everything. See, we're living from heaven above as born-again believers in Christ according to the Word of God, and we're going to operate in the Spirit. As we do so, we'll see God's ways, heaven's ways, His will come to pass in our life if we do what he says. That is the way you and I are to live. Jesus operated according to the word of God and did everything that he was supposed to do. John 6, 39, he says, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. He didn't lose anything that was given unto him. God doesn't want us to lose anything that has been given unto us or things that we have worked in our life. In fact, in 2 John, verse 8, he says, Look to yourselves, that you lose not those things which you have wrought or worked, but that we receive a full reward. You're going to be rewarded for all of your works. God is the one who is going to bring those rewards for those whose works abide. Remember, the ones that don't, they get burned up, they suffer loss. Well, all the things that you have wrought, you're not to lose anything. So you do receive a full reward, but that also implies you could lose things that you have wrought if you do not continue to walk in the ways of the Lord. That means nothing is to be stolen by the enemy. We're to bring forth fruit. We're to possess promises. We're to see the blessings of God come forth in our life. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us, Let us therefore fear the fear of the Lord lest a promise be left us. No promises to be left us. We're to possess them all. 
of entering into his rest. That's what we enter into now, the spiritual rest of God, possessing the promises in our life. That any of you should seem to come short of it. We're not to come short of it or to be behind. No, we're to possess everything that he has for us in our life. Of course, how's it going to happen? Through the word. He says, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Why? Just because you've heard the word doesn't mean it automatically profits you. It depends on what you do with it. You've got to be a doer of that which you hear. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You're going to put your faith in operation by working your faith, doing what the word says, speaking the word, praying the word, in some manner putting the word of God in operation so it produces the promises of God in your life. And that is what God wants. Circumstances can come from the devil. They can come from the world. They can come because of what things you've done. They can come from other people. Circumstances can come because of God being put in operation because of the word that you have spoken and done. Also, as you put the angels in operation, they will accomplish things to perform the word. It all depends on what we are doing with the word of God in our life. Now, circumstances that are going to come from God are going to be because of us doing what he says. Look what happens in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. It shall come to pass, if, this is the condition that you and I must meet, thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. That means you hearken and obey and do what he says. To observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. The Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. You can't even get away from them. They're going to catch you. If you shall hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Otherwise, God is going to perform his word. The results of you hearkening diligently, doing what he says, will bring the blessings to pass. So, the blessings should be coming on us, and they should be overtaking us, if we are diligently hearkening to the voice of the Lord, doing all of his commandments, obeying the things that he tells us to do. That's what he wants. God brings good things. I'll tell you, he's not bringing things that are, that are bringing destruction for those who are walking in his ways. You're walking in his ways, he's going to bring good things to you. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He doesn't change, he's the same, and he is going to perform his word as you do what he says. And he's going to bring forth his good gifts, the good things that he wants to bring forth and manifest in your life. In Jeremiah, chapter 29, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, look what it says. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God wants to give good things to you. He'll bring thoughts of peace. He's going to bring things to give you an expected end, to bring his blessings upon you. That's what he purposes for you in your life as you put him first place. Of course, you're going to have to walk in his ways and be obedient. It doesn't happen automatically. We see in Psalms 23 where the Lord's our shepherd. And if we're truly, he's our shepherd, that means we're a sheep following him closely, obeying the word of God. He's going to meet every need in your life. And it comes down to verse 6 and he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's goodness and mercy will come. He's not holding anything back. It would be the choices that we make or what we're doing. We could be giving place to the enemy or not overcoming the enemy or not doing the word or walking even in our own ways, and that will hinder him from accomplishing what he purposes in our life. Remember the scripture we looked at the other week in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it literally says, as Young's brings out, as we've known, that to those loving God, who are the ones loving God? The ones keeping His commandments, keeping His word, doing what He says. All things do work together for good. Why? Because you're doing the word. You're putting Him in operation. And then He is going to work on your behalf to bring forth good things. 
as you are the called, and he wants to bring forth his purposes to pass in your life. Of course, you have an enemy. The enemy would want to try to bring destruction. You've got to be on guard to conquer every attacks of the enemy. John 10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, destroy, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Does this mean that the enemy can just come and steal, kill, and destroy whenever he wants? No, there has to be conditions. We talked about this before, but for you who haven't seen it, it's important to understand. Notice to steal, to kill, to destroy. They look like they're infinitives. And we have infinitives in English just like they have infinitives in Greek. Well, when we put the cursor over the word steal, it is not an infinitive. It is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood in the Greek is a conditional statement, meaning that the way you would translate it is, the thief cometh not, but that he might steal if conditions are met, and that he might kill if conditions are met, again the subjunctive mood, and that he might destroy. That means don't think that, well, the devil's after me and he's doing all these terrible things and, uh, you know, I just have to put up with what's attack coming at me. Not so. The only way he can work is if you allow this to happen from some reason, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But here, there's conditions. Now, when it says, I am come that they might have life, this is also conditional. It's not automatic. You have to meet the conditions. When he talks about having here, this is also a subjunctive mood verb, conditional statement. This time, though, it's also a present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So the way you would understand this to be translated is, I am come, that you may be continually having life. That's what he wants. Not just once in a while, continually having life. And that you might be continually having it more abundantly, but you do have to meet the conditions of walking in line with the Word. It doesn't automatically come. Remember, you're the one that must choose life, choose blessing, choose the things that please Him, choose to walk in the ways of the Lord and be obedient if you're going to see Him accomplish the things that He purposes. Now, all circumstances, as we have mentioned, are, of course, not orchestrated by God or not coming from God whatsoever. You've got to be ready to deal with situations. In fact, you've got to put the word first place so you're ready to do what God wants you to do. Suppose you just decide to deal with things yourself after your own ways. No, we're not going to get anywhere. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2 says, I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What's the, what was rebellious about them? which walk into the way that was not good after their own thoughts. You can't walk in your own way after your own thoughts and be right with God. That's a rebellious person. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to submit your thoughts unto the Word so you're thinking on what the Word says and you're walking in a way that's in line with the Word of God, doing what the Word says in every situation. Otherwise, if you walk according to your thoughts, uh, you're just going to, your circumstances are not going to be directed by God. They're not going to, you're not going to be ruling and reigning over things because you can have all kinds of thoughts. Thoughts that might just come totally from you, your own desires without submitting to Him, or thoughts that might come from the enemy, or thoughts that come just from your involvement in things in the world if you don't guard yourself. We see over in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it's written, there's none righteous, no, not one, none that understands, none that seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's the way everybody is out there in the world. Can you follow what the world tells you or what people of the world are going to bring you? No. You don't want to follow the wisdom of this world or any of these things. You want to follow the wisdom of God that comes from the Word which means you're going to seek after him and put him first place. Look at the statement that Paul makes in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21. He says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, 
not the things that are Jesus Christ. That's quite an indictment against the church here. He can have, didn't have anybody who was like-minded. That meant their minds weren't renewed to the Word of God. They were walking after their own thoughts. Who would naturally care for your state. What was their problem? They were seeking their own. If you are going to follow after the Lord, you must deny yourself. You can't be seeking your own. Or the thing, instead, we're supposed to be thinking that, seeking the things that are Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus makes quite a statement in verse 23. He said to them all, If any man wills, this is the main verb in the clause here, if he wills, present tense, continually sets his will, to come, the word come is an infinitive. You miss the translation here because they didn't translate the infinitive properly in the King James, but it is an infinitive. That's why Young's translates, if anyone wills to come after me. You set your will to come after him. What's the first thing you do? You don't just do what you want. You don't address things the way you want to do it. Let him deny himself. If you don't deny yourself, you're going nowhere. You're going to be, your circumstances are going to be all over the place. The devil's going to be working left and right. You're going to see all types of destruction. Let him deny himself. He's also to take up his cross daily, which is the crucifying of the flesh. Why? What's in the flesh? Sins dwelling in the flesh, in the body. If you don't crucify the flesh, you'll be walking in sin, following your feelings, following the desires of the flesh. And follow me, which is to put the Word of God first place. This is mandatory. If you don't deny yourself, crucify the flesh daily, and follow the Word of God, the devil will be working your circumstances left and right. And you will see, you won't see God's blessings come. You won't see the power of God in operation to accomplish the things that He wants for you in your life. It is so important that we understand you are not your own. You have been born again. And what has happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? That's critical for you to understand. Until you really get the revelation established in you, you're not your own, which means you belong to Him, which means you're now to walk according to His ways only. You're not going to go very far. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It belongs to Him. He bought the whole deal. You belong to Him. You can't be walking in your own ways. You say, well, how did that happen? He purchased you. In Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. You and I have been purchased. We were under the dominion of Satan, remember? But now we're not. Now we've been purchased and we belong unto the Lord. And as a purchased possession, you know, it even talks about that over in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. Talking about the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Talking about our body, till we get a brand new body. Unto the praise of His glory. You are a purchased possession. Your body is not yours. You can't do with your body what you want to do. It's amazing how many Christians just do anything they want to do with their body instead of glorifying God and walking in His ways. No. You are to glorify Him in everything. In fact, we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, that He died for all, that they which live would be all those born again, should not, because everybody's not born again, is spiritually dead, remember, has, should not henceforth live unto themselves. You can't live unto yourself, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. You are going to live unto Him. Well, what are we going to do about these circumstances? All negative circumstances can be changed by the power of God through the Word. Any present circumstances that are good, that are from the Lord, can be continued and maintained as you walk in line with the Word. Future circumstances can be shaped and brought into being 
same way, through the Word of God that you put in operation. Now suppose you have things that need to be changed. <coughs> How are you going to do this? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Remember, Jesus was speaking forth the word of, by the, of the power of God. That's how he ran, every, accomplished everything. You're going to operate according to the power of God. The power of God gets resident in you when you get the word in you. That's how you, you put the whole armor of God through the word in your heart, in your mind, in your mouth, in directing your steps, and the power of God is resident within you. And then you put it in operation by speaking it, doing it, hearing it, praying it, acting upon it, to release it out with mighty force. So you and I are going to operate according to the power of God. That's how you're going to conquer. If you're going to try to deal with things in the flesh, you'll just be spinning your wheels forever. Try to deal with your own mental power, and willpower, and so forth. It's not going to get it done. You need to put God first place and do what His Word says and live by the power of God. Now, negative circumstances many times, of course, can come because of sin. That what, is, what has held back God's blessings from coming? Well, there's a reason, remember? Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things. Your sins have withholden good things from you. God's not holding anything back. It's our iniquities or our sins that have withholden things. That means we've got to conquer the sins and the iniquities so we aren't seeing anything being, holding back the things that God wants to bring forth for us in our life. And we also see we must have a track record. So many try to just get God to do something for them in a moment's time, yet they have not come to the place of true repentance and walking in the ways of the Lord, and they wonder why God's not just some push-button God that's going to respond immediately. No. Psalms 84, verse 11. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from who? Whoever wants it just now? No. From those who walk uprightly. And when we talk about walking uprightly, the word walk, in the Hebrew, the mood is a participle active, which is like the present tense. It means a continuous, ongoing, repeated action. That's why Young translates it, those walking in uprightness. Consistent walk. Without a consistent walk, can you really expect that God is going to accomplish everything in your circumstances? That's a total selfish attitude to approach God thinking that I can just do something for you know, this moment and then just go back to my own ways the rest of the time. No, it is not going to happen. And when there is Areas of sin, they need to be dealt with to turn away any negatives that have come in captivity in your life. Look at the scripture in Lamentations 2.14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, for they have not discovered thine iniquity. Well, why do I need to discover the iniquity? Because that's how you got in the problem you are in, because of the iniquity or the sin that opened up the door that gave place to the enemy in your life. But they've seen for the false burdens and causes of banishment. What will happen? You'll be able to turn the captivity if you discover the iniquity because then you'll deal with that iniquity. And not only will you confess the sin, repent, turn from it, but you can also cast out the spirits that have come in from it and get set free from the captivity that the enemy has brought forth because of giving place to the sin in your life. Now I've had some people say, well, I'm just going to not receive those negative things or any kind of things that would have come against me. I'm just going to stand against it and not receive it. <laughs> well, I've had people say, well, you know, uh, what was the doctor's report? Well, they said you have diabetes or you have cancer, you have a tumor, you have this problem. Well, I'm not going to receive the doctor's report. That's foolishness. Mm -hmm. It's already there. <laughs> mm -hmm. If he saw it in your body and it's there, it's already there. I'm just not going to receive it. Is that going to get rid of it? No. You've got to get rid of it. You've got to eliminate it. Not say, I'm not going to receive it. I have lots of people say, that. I'm not going to receive any of these negative things when it's already there in their body. No, you've got to get on the attack and eliminate that 
by casting out the spirits and taking hold of healing and correcting the problem and seeing things get turned around. Of course, what are causes for so many negative things? Your sins, your mistakes, doing things after the flesh, your own way. Other people's sins against you were victimization where they've been destructive against you. Direct attacks from the devil, of course, can come against you. And also inherited curses. Inherited curses are the number one negative influence in most everybody's life because of the iniquities of the forefathers that are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And you have to understand, in numbers, well, first of all, we'll look over here. People, people think that you can't even have an inherited curse in the body of Christ, which is astounding that they think you can't have that when the scripture is very clear. Lamentations 5, 7. Our fathers have sinned, that's our forefathers, and are not, that means they've passed away. And we have borne their iniquities. That's pretty clear. An inherited generational iniquity result from the sin of our forefathers who aren't here any longer. Everybody has inherited generational iniquity curses that have come down the line. We see in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18. The Lord is long suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. That's right. By no means though clearing the guilty. Now you don't get away with it just because, you know, unless you deal with it. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Inherited generational iniquity curses come down the line, meaning you're affected by the sins of your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and even great-great-grandparents. And those sins have given place to iniquity curses which are enforced by evil spirits that come in at the time of conception to carry out the destructive work. This is why you need to look, take a good look at your inheritance line. And don't wonder why things have happened. Well, I wonder why I got this tumor. Well, mom had a tumor, grandmother had a tumor. Yeah, everybody, every, they had a lot of tumors in the family line. Well, now you know where it came from. Inherited generational. You may not have done a thing to cause that. It may have just been inherited generational that manifested. Diabetes coming down the line, cancer coming down the line, Everybody has anger problems coming down the line. Everybody has addictive compulsive problems coming down the line, on and on and on. You always have to look at what's in the inheritance line and see what you need to deal with because these inherited curses are, have affected you. And there's even those that are even 10 generations long. 10 generations? Boy, I could really have a lot of problems. That's right. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2. A bastard, which is an illegitimate child. And look at all the illegitimate conceptions that we have seen in the past 50 years or so. Tremendous numbers. Shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to the 10th generation. The ten, it's a 10 generation curse that shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. The effect of this, it hinders them from not only coming to the Lord, but even after they're born again, entering into the things of God. I've seen people that have had this seem like they're, they seem to backslide or, or turn away. They just never seem to kind of get on board until they get these spirits cast out of them and the illegitimacy. Also, the Ammonite or Moabite, that's a product of incest. Remember Ammon and Moab were the children from the incestual relationship of Lot and his daughters? They shall not enter in the congregation of the Lord even to their tenth generation. Shall they not enter in the congregation of the Lord forever? Why do we see so many people, young people, having so many big time problems? Because when they have illegitimacy is one of the big reasons. They got 10 generation curses upon them that are causing all kinds of problems in their life. Does that mean I'm sunk? No. You just need to know what it is so you can get rid of it. And how can we get rid of it? By casting out the demons and getting set free. Well, if it's because of my sins, what am I going to do about these circumstances that have come from my sins? Can I do something about it? Absolutely. Because of the New Testament that we're error, the course that we're in, and because of what Jesus has accomplished, 1 John 1 9 says, We can confess our sins. And God is one who can bring forth a forgiveness and a cleansing if we meet the conditions, as we will point out to you. First of all, 
you must understand this verse has three subjunctive mood verbs in it, which is critical to understand. If we confess our sins, well, that's the first step. Meaning I'm confessing such and such a sin, you know, showing the fact that this is a wrong thing that I have done. Subjunctive mood. He is faithful and just, righteous. It says to forgive. It looks like an infinitive. That just because I confess my sin, does he automatically forgive me? That's what everybody thinks. No. Because forgive is not an infinitive. It is also a subjunctive mood verb, which is a conditional statement meaning you would translate it, he is faithful and just that he might forgive us, or as Young's brings it out, that he may forgive us our sins. Well, that means there's another condition on this one. And then it says, and to cleanse. Well, is that also, an, uh, uh, do we have an infinitive there? Nope, no infinitive, it's again a subjunctive mood that he may cleanse us or might cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's that tell us? You, first of all, confess your sins. You've got to acknowledge your sins. You can't cover it over. You've got to deal with it. Confess that as sin, which is anything that's contrary to the Word of God. All unrighteousness is sin. Not only sins you know you've committed, but even, you know, it says, him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. If he, some things that he knew to do, and yet he didn't do it. Sins of omission as well as sins of commission. So we need to deal with that sin. Confess the sin. But we're also going to have to meet the conditions for forgiveness. Well, what's that going to be? Well, that means we can't continue in it any longer, and we must have a true repentance and turning away from it in our life if we're going to see that happen. We know that, as we see over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Godly sorrow, which is what we're to have for sin, worketh repentance, it will work a change of mind, so you're not going to continue in that any longer. Two, salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And if you really have true repentance, we've talked about this in the past, but we'll bring it up again, you're going to do something about this situation. Behold the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sore, and what diligence, the word carefulness means diligence, spude, it wrought in you. You're going to be diligent to deal with this thing and get rid of it out of your life. What clearing of yourselves, you're going to get yourself clear of this thing. You're not going to allow this to continue in your life. What indignation, you should be upset and irritated that you gave place to this sin because sin has no dominion over you. You can't just pass it off. Well, everybody sins, you know. No, that's the wrong attitude. You should be, have an irritation against it. What fear, the fear of the Lord, realizing the fact that I can't continue to walk in this sin or I'm going to see all kinds of destruction coming. What vehement desire, longing to deal with this and conquer it. What zeal, you're going to be zealous. And what revenge against this sin, I'm not going to give place to this. I am going to make sure that I do not yield to this sin again. Well, how are you going to overcome this? You're going to overcome it because you're going to get the word in you. You're going to get your mind renewed to the Word of God. You're going to get the Word in you, which is the power of God in you, so that you'll be able to conquer this thing. That's how you're going to be approved to be clear in the matter. Otherwise, you won't be approved of it. We go back to 1 John also, verse 9, when it talks about the cleansing part. That also was a conditional statement. How do we get cleansed? from all unrighteousness. Well, that means we're going to have to purge everything out of our life. We're going to get rid of these fleshly works and get rid of all the evil spirits that have come into us. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we have these promises that we're to possess. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, this is our responsibility, cleanse ourselves. You're to cleanse yourself. Don't just think, well, well you know, Nobody's perfect. We have, everybody's going to sin. Everybody's going to do these things. That is a demonic attitude. That is a sinful attitude. That is an attitude that's totally contrary to the word and of the devil. 
You are to conquer all sin. You can overcome in every situation. You are to be completely victorious. And you are to see every sin be put underfoot. You are commanded to be holy as he is holy. So we're going to cleanse ourselves from all, not some, filthiness, the defilement it causes in your life of the flesh, any sins of the flesh, and then also of the spirit, the filthiness of the spirit or the evil spirits that have come into you because there's no filthiness in our spirit. The filthy, unclean spirits are unclean spirits, which are demons. And what's that going to do? That's going to perfect holiness and the fear of God. And we must come to the place of being holy before the Lord. Therefore, you confess your sins. You have a godly sorrow that works true repentance and turn away from it. And then you'll be forgiven. And you cleanse yourself from all these evil things. Then you'll be cleansed from all the unrighteousness, which is all the effects of sin. That is what he expects for us. That means that we must really have a repentance. A true repentance from anything in our life. And it's not just I'm sorry because I got a problem from it. You sh our sorrow should be before God. It's a godly sorrow, remember. Hebrews 6.1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection where we're headed. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. <clears throat> the first one that's listed as the foundation to be laid in your life is repentance from dead works. Repentance means changing your mind, and if you change your mind, you're now going to do something different. You're not going to continue in those ways any longer. You continue in your ways, you haven't repented. Oh, so many say, well, I repent. And they do the same thing again. You didn't repent, you just gave words. You just mouthed something. No, repentance is shown in action, isn't it? From dead works. You can't be doing those dead works any longer and have truly repented. You get the word in you and you start doing what the word says. And of course, what is God always going to lead you to do and guard any areas of sin that have allowed evil circumstances to come your way? Romans 2, 4 says, the latter part, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. He will always lead you to repentance. Because he wants to get things turned around and bring blessings in your life. And we've been hindering him, remember, because of our sins and iniquities. He's withholding the good things from us in our life. So oh, that's, that's very important. And remember, true repentance is not just shown just because I made some good choices and thoughts, thinking it does mean to change your mind, but it's going to be shown by change in action, too, because... What shows forth real repentance? Matthew 3, 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, worthy of or showing forth repentance. Well, how do I get fruit? I plant the seed in the ground. It didn't produce fruit the next morning. It had to grow and develop. It had to be fed. It had to come forth in due season to bring fruit. Same thing in you. You're going to hear and do the word consistently and the fruit will be evidence that you are doing the word consistently in your life. Otherwise, you have a track record. Acts chapter 26 tells us another aspect of showing forth true repentance. The latter part says that they should repent, turn to God, and what? Do works. Meet for repentance. Your works. So the fruit, evidence you're walking in line with the Word, and your works, your continual works, show forth whether there's true repentance. So it's not just I say something, or it's more than just I change my mind. I might change my mind for a minute and then go right back to doing it again. We can't be doing that. We must get the Word in us and correct the problems in our life. What does the Word do that gift comes into you? James 1, verse 21. Wherefore... Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. The word engrafted is a word which means implanted. The implanted word. The word is to be implanted in you. It's getting implanted in your heart and it's implanted in your mind. So you'll have the correct motivation from your heart and your mind will be able to think correctly. Notice it's, it has the able or has the power to save your souls. 
It'll do a work in the soulless realm. And of course, then you need to put it in operation in your life, being a doer of it. That's why he says, but be really means become. The word ginnamai, become, as Young translates it correctly. And this is not just once in a while. This is consistency, present tense. Continually become, ongoingly, doers of the word. Otherwise, you're gonna, this is your lifestyle that's going to show the change. This is going to show the track record. This is going to show whether you're the real deal or not. Are you going to be doing the word consistently or not? And this also is an imperative mood. This is a command to you and me. Well, I try my best. That's not, that's not getting it done. It's an imperative mood. If it's a command to you, you do it. You order your life after the word. I am a doer of this word consistently. That's it. That's what I'm walking by. Not hearers only, or you deceive your own selves. Many people are hearers only, but they don't, they don't do the word, and they deceive themselves. Well, I heard it. Well, just because you heard it doesn't mean it stayed in you, because the devil comes to take it out of your heart. And how will he get it out of your heart if you don't do it? If you do it, and it gets incorporated into your lifestyle, he won't be able to take it out, because that's the way you live. That's the way you do things consistently in your life. So if you're going to correct sin, mistakes, wrong choices that you've made that caused your negative circumstances, we've got to correct all these areas and get the Word of God in first place. And you want to be free. This is what the Word says about it's going to produce freedom in you. Again, everybody wants to be, I want to be free now, you know. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't work that way. John 8, 31. Look what it says. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if, conditional statement, you continue in my word, that means to abide and remain in it. If you're continuing in the word, well, that means I'm consistent doer of it, right? Then are you my disciples indeed. Who's a disciple? A disciplined one. He's got the track record. He's got the lifestyle. He's living according to it consistently. Then what? And you shall know the truth. Meaning you really never know the truth until you're doing the Word and you become a disciplined one. You may have some revelation of some things, but you really don't know it until you know it experientially in your life, having done it and worked it into your life, that this is the truth. Knowing the truth, the truth shall make you free. How do you get to the place of being at free and liberty? By the truth. But how do you get to the truth? You've got to come to knowing the truth. And the, way, the only way you know the truth is through the Word of God that you hear and do and become a disciplined one, a true disciple. Not just because you heard something for a moment and think that that produces the truth in me that should automatically produce freedom. No, it's becoming a disciplined one, a disciple, and having a track record. At the same time, if you've been sinning and giving place to the devil, you got to do something about that. You cannot be allowing the enemy to continue to have place in your life. Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. Place is the word topos, which means a place of residence, an inhabited place or a place of residence where the enemy can come in and reside within you. Well, how would we give place to the devil? Through sin. And this is a command to you and me. This isn't a nice little suggestion. This is a command. God is commanding you to not give place to the devil continuously, present tense, in your life. Period. That's it. If you haven't set your will that I'm going to stop this sin, you're going to give place to the devil continually. And you think God's blessings are going to come upon you? No. Do you think you're going to have good circumstances? It's not going to happen. You're going to have nothing but havoc continually occurring because of not doing the Word of God. And what happens when you sin? Ah, your, is your hedge of protection built up anymore? Nope. Your hedge is down. Remember what happened to Job? Because of his fear, what he feared came upon him, what he greatly feared came unto him because the hedge was down. Look what it says here in the latter part of this verse, Ecclesiastes 10.8. Whoso breaketh a hedge, who's breaking the hedge? 
God's not breaking the hedge. The devil's not breaking the hedge. You're breaking the hedge. Man is breaking the hedge by not doing the word, by walking in sin. What happens? A serpent shall bite him. Ah, the devil has an open door to come after you, and you better believe he will. In fact, you must understand that everything operates according to spiritual law. And the devil still, at this point, until he's, till after Jesus begins to take back the authority and to take back and begin to rule and reign in the millennial reign, but up to this time, the accuser of the brethren, the devil is still operating in heaven against you. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What's he accusing us of? Of our sins. Why? He gives them a legal right according to spiritual law. He understands how things operate. He can send his demons to you, and you can't stop them from coming into you. Well, I'm just going to stand against them and say, I'm not going to receive them. <laughs> it ain't going to do you any good whatsoever. You can say that all you want. Because look what happens if you do not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Remember, we saw all the blessings will come on you and overtake you and get you. Well, what's it say in verse 15? It shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, not just suggestions, not try your best, commands. All these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee. You can't get away from them. Can I stop these negative things? Sure, if you're walking in line with God's word and you're doing what's right in his sight. You see, what you and I choose is going to be determining what is going to be happening in our life, whether we give place to the enemy or not. Well, what else are we going to have to do? As you deal with the areas of sin and you close the door and you, you correct yourself and continue in the word and become a true disciple, you're also going to have to cast out the demons that have come in. Many Christians will never get to the place of being holy and never get the enemies out of their life and wondering why they've had negative circumstances throughout their life because they haven't learned to cast out the demons. They believe the lie that all the demons are gone when they're born again. <laughs> what a lying teaching deceives the multitudes. Most every place out there teaches that. Oh, you're born again, all the demons are gone. They can't be in you at the same time as the presence of God in you. Oh, yes, they can in a different location in your soul and in your body. And what does it say in Mark 16, 17? These signs shall follow them that believe. That's every believer. Is this a special ministry? No. In my name shall they cast out devils. Right. Who's supposed to cast out devils? Every believer. Mm -hmm. I've even had pastors say, well, that must be your anointing or special ministry. I say, no. It's everybody's anointing and special ministry that everybody has to cast out demons. Are you a believer? Yes. Are you to cast out demons? Yes. If we're not casting out demons, why not? Uh, uh, well, they said we don't have any. <laughs> they lied to you. Everybody's got them. He would never tell us as believers to cast out demons if we didn't have them. We obviously have them and we are to cast out the demons. Well, how did I get them? From sin. Well, yeah, I've sinned some in my life. I, I didn't think I had demons come in, though. How about from inheritance line? We've got loads of them. Why have you had the same problems as people in your inheritance line? Demons that have come into you, that are driving you to do the same things. This is why we've got to cast out all the demons. And we also need to take hold of the promises of God. Walk in line with the Word. Take hold of His grace and mercy in our life. Otherwise, you don't just put up with things. You don't put up with circumstances. Jesus controlled everything by the spoken word of His power. You're going to speak the word. You're going to take hold of everything that belongs to you. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain. Lombano, take hold of. Mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. Can I just do that anytime I want? Uh, only if you meet the conditions. Subjunctive mood. There have to be conditions. You can't take hold of mercy if you're not right with him. 
and you're not going to find grace. Well, I thought I could find grace and find a need. God will help me for sure, won't he? No, not unless you met the conditions, subjunctive mood. You're walking in sin. You shut off the grace of God. God's not holding it back. Remember, he's not withholding anything from us. So the way we're going to overcome everything and see God bringing forth his, the manifestation of his promises and, and rule over all of our circumstances, we're going to correct all of our sins. We're going to correct all mistakes. We're going to deny ourselves, and we're going to live according to the word of God. We're going to get our mind renewed to the truth. We're going to have a true godly sorrow that works repentance, and we're going to deal with everything in our life and walk in his ways, evidenced by true repentance of fruit and works. And we're going to cast out all these demons and get set free and take hold of the promises. How about other sins against me? Yeah, people have done a lot of destructive things to me. I've been abused, you know, I've been rejected, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been neglected, and so forth. Well, are you going to live under that the rest of your life? You don't have to. So, well, you don't know what I've been through in my life. I've had people tell me that all the time. I say, well, I'm sorry that you, what you've been through, and I understand that I'm not going to be able to know because you don't know all the things I've been through either. But nonetheless, I can get free of them, you can get free of them, all of us can get free of them. Don't use that as a reason for why I should put up with my problems, you know, because you don't know what I've been through, through what, what's happened to me. It's kind of like a little excuse for why I should put up with my poor old, poor old me, you know, my problems that I've had, things that went through happened in my life. No. You can overcome everything. It's all going to start with you've got to forgive. Anybody that did anything wrong to you, you must forgive them. If you don't hold to forgive them, it means you're going to hold unforgiveness against them. And you're going to be in trouble. Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, well, if you forgive them, oh, that's a subjunctive mood, isn't it? conditional statement. Then your Heavenly Father will forgive you. You've got to meet the condition. He's not going to forgive you unless you forgive somebody, them what they've done to you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, I'm not going to forgive that person what they did to me. I hate them. You know, I wish they were dead and all these kind of terrible things. It's amazing what people think. Mm -hmm. Either will your Father forgive your trespasses. You can't have those kind of attitudes. You must forgive regardless of what happened to you. Forgive that person. Forgive that mother. Forgive that father. Forgive that son. Forgive that daughter. Forgive that grandparent. Forgive that person that molested you. Forgive that person that abused you. Forgive that person that stole from you. Whatever. Because it's destroying your relationship with God and giving place to the devil who's coming in. And you will see nothing but destruction coming your way. Look at Matthew 18. Matthew 18, down in verse 34 and 35. This is where the guy had been forgiven of a great debt, but he wouldn't forgive the guy of a small debt. You and I have been forgiven of a great debt of all of our sins, and we won't forgive someone of the small amount of sins that they sinned against us. The Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. The tormentors are the demons. And he goes on and brings us into forgiveness in the next verse. So likewise, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. He'll deliver you to the tormentors. See, that's the result because you won't choose to do the word of God. Because remember, God won't forgive you. So you're going to be in the tent tormentors if you won't forgive someone else. If you from your hearts, and it can't just be going through the motions, I'll forgive them because I have to. Attitude. <laughs> that's no good. It's got to be genuine from the heart. Everyone is brother that trespasses. You must forgive. Let it go. Well, I forgive him, but I'm angry about it. <laughs> no, you can't be doing that. You got to let go of everything. Anger rests in the bosom of fools, the Bible says, and it will destroy you. Look what it says in Ephesians 4, what we're supposed to do. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Don't be speaking evil about them. Don't be in anger. Don't be held in wrath. 
You want to retaliate. Don't want a bitterness. You can't be holding those things. You've got to let it go. Water over the dam, is, it's done. Spilled milk is done. What's happened has happened. Let it go. Let go of the bitterness, the wrath, the anger, the clamor, the evil speaking, and get in line with what you're supposed to be doing. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Because you want to get yourself healed and delivered from the effects of what happened to you. And God will deliver you and restore you and heal your soul. He will heal your soul if you do what needs to be done. You've got to let go of this stuff. Because also, if you hold on to these things, not only will it destroy you, but you'll be a destructive force to others. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. I thought the grace of God was automatic. That's what they told me. They told you a lie. You can fail of the grace of God. Remember, it's conditional. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and there many be defiled. Bitterness, it'll eat at you and trouble you. And it'll work through you to defile others because it'll come out of your mouth. It'll come out of your attitudes. You've got to let go of everything that is not of the Lord. Let it all go. Don't hold on to any of these things. You say, well, what am I going to do about this situation with these people? Well, if people will not come in line with the word, people that have done things to you, you want them... If they're causing problems, this is what the Word says. Romans 16, 17. I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses. If someone is causing you problems, contrary to the doctrine you've learned, which, of course, is walking in love and, uh, and forgiveness and letting go in bitterness and all these things, avoid them. You, you don't let one person destroy your life. Don't let a coworker destroy your life. Don't let some evil person destroy your what life. You can't let that happen. You say, well, well, I didn't think I, I could I avoid them because they're in my home. Well, the Bible tells you that you will have problems, unfortunately, because did Jesus come to bring peace? Luke 12, 51. Suppose I'm come to bring, give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. What's he going to do? He's going to bring division between those who are going to walk in the way of the Lord and those that are not going to walk in the way of the Lord. He doesn't authority, have authority over people's wills, remember. For from henceforth there will be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. Father be divided against the son, son against the father, mother against the daughter, daughter against the mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There can be division. You cannot compromise the Word of God for anybody. You know, you're going to have to just deal with the situation if you're going to walk in line with the Word of God. And if you're a head over your household, you are responsible to make sure that you are commanding your house in line with the Word of God. This is Abraham. God said, for I know him, in Genesis 18, 19, for I know him, he will command his children, his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. You command it. Not just give them a suggestion and let them do what they want. To do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham which he has, spoke, what he, which he has spoken of him. Notice the condition. The Lord may bring upon Abraham. Otherwise, it's not going to happen unless he meets the conditions of commanding his household and keeping the way of the Lord and doing what is righteous. Well, what am I going to do if they won't listen to me? You're going to restrain them from evil. You're going to do whatever needs to be done. Remember Eli? Eli did not restrain his sons from evil. And what happened? Not only did his sons die, he died. You all pay the price. You can't do that. You got to command and you got to restrain them from evil. If they won't listen to you and they want to watch this filthy stuff, then you take away the source of the filthy stuff. If they're going to consistently watch all this garbage on, on their phone and stuff, take it away and give them a flip phone. That'll solve the problem. 
too bad, you don't have any access anymore. You gotta do something. You can't let it continue on. You can't let filth continue on. You gotta take a stand and say, no, that's it. That's what you have to do with children. You even have to do it with adults. <laughs> you have to do it. You gotta bring this household in line with the word of God, otherwise, you're going to see the devil have place and come in and bring all kinds of destruction. We can't allow that. God expects us to do what is right in his sight. Now, how about those people, though, that have been destructive? Again, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. We command you, brethren, this is not a suggestion, it's a command. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you withdraw yourself from every brother. Well, they're a Christian. It doesn't mean they're walking right. A lot of Christians aren't walking right, unfortunately. Every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition that you received of us. Am I going to be in fellowship with someone that's going to be walking disorderly? No. We've got to do the right thing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, mark that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Well, they're going to think some bad, some evil of me. Well, you tell them why, so they can understand. And you call them to repentance, and hopefully they will, so you can gain your brother. Remember, what do we do if someone has done something? We want to do what we can do to bring restoration, of course. But restoration can only be done when it's done right. Not just, I'm going to put up with it and just let it slide. No. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Mm -hmm. Don't go and tell the world. Go talk to him directly. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And then you get it straightened out. That's the ideal thing. If he'll not hear thee, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established and get this thing established. If he neglects to tell them, hear them, you tell it to the church, and if he neglects to hear the church, then he's as a heathen man or a public and he gets disfellowshipped, doesn't he? Because he's not walking right in line with the word. We can't let sin be in the camp. What happened when there was sin in the camp? Remember what happened, Achan? The whole group, they lost their battle and they got defeated at Ai in the Old Testament because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They had, to they had sin in the camp. You got to deal with all areas of sin. And another thing, you can't be just putting up with the situation. You need to stand up and declare what's right and call the people to repentance. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 we are as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men. We can't be a man pleaser, but pleasing God, which trieth our hearts. That's right. He's going he's to see, are you going to stand up for the truth, or are you going to compromise and just let this thing slide? You can't do that. You've got to be a God pleaser. Galatians 1, verse 10. For now, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? This is a major problem in churches today. Too many of their pleasing men. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We've got to correct everything. We've got to stand up and do what is right and see God accomplish the things he wants, which is to see restoration come. He wants to see people get restored. He wants them to see him come to repentance. It wants to see him return and restored to righteousness and get right with him. Now, how about if these attacks are coming directly from the devil? And we'll just begin to talk about this for a moment. Remember, you need to discover the iniquity roots. Any curses that have come upon you have a cause. Proverbs 26, verse 2 says, So the curse causeless shall not come. There's a cause for it. So I need to find out what the cause of it is so I can deal successfully with it. So I can eliminate that cause. And then I can cast out the spirits that have come in from that. 
Now, you have authority over all the power of the enemy, and you've got to use your authority. Say, well, the devil's been attacking me. Well, has he made some entrance into you? Uh, yeah, I got these problems. Well, what is the answer? Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you authority, exousia, to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power, all the power of the enemy. Not some. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Yeah, they told me, just confess this and nothing will ever hurt me. And I, I got beat up. I wonder why it didn't work. Because it's not a confession. When it says nothing shall by any means hurt you, this is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning, oh, for nothing to not, any by any means not to not hurt me, it's a condition that has to be met. What's the condition? Use your authority against the power of the enemy. Otherwise, you rise up with your authority and you begin to cast out these devils and you begin to speak to those mountains or hindrances. You begin to resist those temptations. You speak against the enemy and conquer everything that would come against you. You are to use your faith and the authority given unto you to conquer and overcome instead of letting the devil destroy you. You and I have dominion. We can take hold of promises. We can overcome every situation in our life. In fact, one last scripture that we'll talk about for this morning. Romans 8, verse 37, is not making a statement of who you are. The King James doesn't do a good job of this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. It's not saying you are more than a conqueror. <clears throat> because this is a verb. Oh, present tense. If it's a verb, it's talking about action, isn't it? What it's saying is, we are completely victorious. That's what it's saying, because this is the word here. Be completely victorious. What the verb means, and it's present tense. We, therefore, we are completely victorious through him that loved us. Well, through him, that's right. We're going to put him in operation. The power of God. The authority he's given us. The weapons of warfare. We're going to put God in operation. We're going to conquer everything. We are completely victorious through Jesus Christ in every situation. He will give you the victory if you do what needs to be done. Because we're going to use our authority. We're going to speak forth the word just like what Jesus did. We're going to come against every attack of the enemy. We're going to make sure we deal with all areas of sin so there's no giving place to the enemy or open door, no hedge down. We're going to conquer everything that comes against us and be completely victorious. That's what he wants. Present tense in everything. You've got to get that mindset. I am completely victorious in every situation through him. That means when I put him in operation, it's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to get the victory in every situation. I'm going to get healed. I'm going to get delivered. I'm going to be prospered. I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be protected. Every need's going to be met. God's going to be doing great things. The angels are going to be out there working on my behalf to bring all these things to pass. See, God, God Jesus, he controlled everything through the word that he spoke that put God in operation to bring forth everything that he purposed. That is what God has for you. You're to rule over all circumstances. Circumstances should not be ruling over you. You are to rule over them by the power of God to see the blessings, the promises, the fruit, the victory come forth in your life. And he'll do it when you do what he says. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you. Because God is not in control of all things, but he's in control of the results. And I am responsible in covenant relationship to hear and do the word, to walk in his ways, 
to take hold of promises, to conquer all areas of sin, to set my will, to walk in his ways, to crucify the flesh, and deny myself, and put him first place, and live by the power of God, and use the authority given unto me, which I will release against the power of the enemy, and I have the faith of Jesus that will conquer every enemy. Through Jesus Christ, I am completely victorious in every situation. And I will see negative circumstances eliminated and the promises coming to pass. I will see that God will bring forth His promises, His blessings overtaking me bringing forth all that he purposes for me continually throughout my life. And I thank you that future circumstances can be shaped and set in order by the word that I speak. And the angels are going forth to prepare the way and to bring me to the place that God has for me. I thank you that I will not allow negative circumstances to rule over my life. I will put the word in operation. I will use the weapons of warfare. I will conquer every attack. Every sin shall be put underfoot. I will show godly sorrow, working true repentance, clearing myself so I am not only forgiven, but I am cleansed from all of the effects of sin. I will conquer and cast out every evil spirit and be set free from all inherited generational curses, the effects of my sins, or victimization. Now I forgive every person who ever wronged me or hurt me in the name of Jesus. And I let go of all bitterness, anger, negative attitudes against every person in the name of Jesus. I will not give place to any sins from what people have done to me. I will cast out all the spirits from victimization and I will walk in line with the Word of God. As I live by the power of God, I will see every promise come forth in my life. I will bring forth fruit. I will know the truth. The truth will make me free. And I will be completely victorious in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. That is how you're going to live. Anything less, you're giving place to the enemy. Or you believe religious lies from false teaching. <laughs> There's so much out there. No. We are going to be completely victorious. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that we can conquer all circumstances. Jesus did it. We can do it. And we will do it by the power of God through the word and all that you have given unto us. We know that we are completely victorious through you as we put you in operation. Thank you, Father, for much fruit from this message because we hear and do it and we will see the circumstances in life be ruled over by the Word of God that brings forth everything that you purpose for every single one of us. Thank you for total, complete victory in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We have more to talk about on this subject.